All right, well, it's a real joy to be here with you again uh, this morning, and I'd like you to please turn with me in your Bibles once again to 1 Timothy as we continue to consider this study on uh, how to behave in the house of God. This will be our final message. We're not going to cover everything that uh, we went through in the original outline. You'll have to fill in the details yourself. But I want to read from chapter 2 again. We looked at it yesterday a little bit, but I'd like to read from verse 11 uh, of chapter 2 into chapter 3, verse 7. And then I want to read our key verses again, verses 14 through 16. So a little bit of reading, but I think it's going to be profitable as we try and tie some things together. So beginning in verse 11, it says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and and holiness with sobriety." This is a true saying, this is chapter 3 now, verse 1, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection, with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. And then please, verse 14, These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And again, God will bless and always blesses the reading of His precious Word to us. So as we consider the house of God, we, uh, the reason I wanted to read from chapter 2 again, uh, you know, we, we mentioned last night a little bit about the, the, the order, the behavior in the house of God. And it's very different to what you would see in a lot of churches today. But this is what the Bible says. So we want want to be faithful to the text of Scripture. And so it says that the the women are to learn in silence uh, with all subjection. Uh, Again, that's not popular in our day, is it? I mean, it's kind of not exactly uh, what our culture would applaud. And yeah, that's what the Scripture says. And then it says that... that, um, there's reasons. Earlier on, we saw that she, she wasn't to publicly lead in prayer either, that the males were to pray. And so th- there's a sense in which the sister might think, well, what's the point? I mean, why should I even go to that church if I can't preach and I can't pray publicly? Like, what's my role? Why do I even bother? And that's why in verse 15, he says, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And I, and I mentioned yesterday, and I really believe this, that what he's saying is, in case she's tempted to feel like, what's the point? That he wants her to know that she's going to be saved from feeling worthless and saved even from loss of eternal reward if she devotes herself to the one need of the hour in our culture, and our society, is godly mothers who will devote themselves to raising the next generation of Timothys and 
Wesleys and Whitfields and all this kind of stuff. And, and it's interesting, I, you, you guys know that I love biographies, and I'm always reading biographies of godly people because it keeps me stirred up, you see. It keeps me from becoming complacent, and especially when you get older, you kind of think, well, I've done my stint. You know, I've been at this for, for you know, 30-odd years, and, you know, it's very easy to do that. And you read these biographies, and you get stirred up again and say, I've got to get out there and get, get working. And so <clears throat> I was reading a biography and uh, just this morning of a man called Duncan Matheson. He was a Scottish evangelist. And prior to his conversion, uh, he, his mother was a very godly woman. And he had profound respect for his mother, but he didn't want the gospel. And even though he kept running into the gospel and hearing the gospel, uh, but, but he didn't want it. He, he just wanted to be a man of the world. But his mother had consumption, or TB, and she had this cough. And, and uh, every time he heard somebody cough, I mean, he was not even living at home. He's miles away from home. Every time he heard somebody cough, he was reminded of the prayers of his mother. And he couldn't get away. And eventually, he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And his mother has a great part to play in that, Right? Just even a cough. And by the way, he, he mentioned just as an aside, he says he wonders, based on his own experience, he wonders if every time Peter heard a cock crow for the rest of his life, did he get brought to tears? <laughs> I just thought that was an interesting aside. But I just want to say this, that, that the powerful impact of a mother. And, and I could give you story after story, uh, another story that comes to mind, and that would be John Newton, the guy that wrote Amazing Grace. You know that story well, right? And, and he was a, a, an absolute rascal. He was, he was a slave trader and lived a, a wicked, wicked life. But he said no matter where he went in the world, he could never get away from the prayers of his mother. And eventually, <laughs> he gave in and surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And so I believe eternity is going to reveal a story. And that story is not the big preachers of this world that, that you know, stood and wowed audiences with their eloquence and all. It's the godly mothers that prayed them into the kingdom of God. And so he says, sister, don't, don't you feel like you have no role here? You have a tremendous, you're shaping the future of assembly testimony by your prayers. Don't lose sight of that. And I think that's really vital. And so that's my Happy Mother's Day thing. That's why I wanted to do that, even though I said a lot of this last night, because it's Mother's Day, and we, you know, we got to, to some ways, be a bit conventional, even though we're, we're known for our unconventionality. But I wanted to at least acknowledge that. But now, uh, chapter 3. So, so when you have this order in the house of God that clearly says you know, the men are to lead in prayer, uh, that the, the women are to learn in silence. Well, whenever you have order, this is, again, God is telling us how to behave in His house. Okay, this is that's the, the kind of key verse that you might know how you should behave in the house of God. So when God has given us this order, whenever you have order, you have to have government. There was somebody has to enforce this. Somebody has to make sure that this is complied with, right? And that's, that's, that's why we have police force, right? Because, because we've got rules like speed limits and things like that. And it's not left to ourselves. And, and so, you know, every time I see a police car, even if I'm not speeding, I immediately look at the speedometer and I almost feel guilty, right? Because <laughs> I don't know what it is, maybe... Uh, past demeanors, I don't know, but, it, but I feel that way. But the, the, the amazing thing is, you see, that God says that, that, yes, there is an order, but it has to be maintained. And that's why we have chapter 3. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, or we might say this way, a man desires the work of oversight, the work of overseeing 
the assembly, of, 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 of watching over the flock. And, and so this is very important. And, and of course, this desire, it comes from the Spirit of God. We learned that yesterday in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It talks about uh, the, the, the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. He's the, the person, the Spirit of God, who puts that burden into the heart of a man to care to God, for God's flock. And, and so he says, if a man desires that, he desires a good work. This is a good work because remember we said the house of God is so important. It's so important because it's the only place where truth, you can be sure to hear the truth. You can't be sure to get it anywhere else. So the house of God is really important, especially in our day. And remember that original statement that I said that this is a testament to God's order in the midst of satanic disorder. The satanic disorder all around us in the world, and yet in the midst of that sea of wickedness in our world, here's the house of God, and, and it's a light in the darkness. It's, it's a testament to divine order in the midst of all this confusion everywhere else. And that's why the house of God is so critical and so important. And so for this man to desire this, God says, through the Apostle Paul, he desires a good work. This is a good work. To, to oversee the house of God. And because it's such a good work, uh, this, this desire has to come from God. It cannot come from selfish ambition because that's always devastating. I've just been going through the book of Judges and I just dealt with Abimelech, uh, the man who would be king. And, and he, again, he had no care for God's people. He just wanted to be the boss and, and he caused devastation. And we don't want men that want a position we want men who have a heart for the flock of God and want to do a work. And, and so it's very important that we understand that. And so this, this work that the Holy Spirit's put on the man's heart, uh, then it talks about the, the facts of what this man should be like. And it mentions a couple of things, and I think they're, they're important things. First of all, it, he, he must be a man of proven character. And so we've got this list of uh, what we would say qualities, qualifications. They're not suggestions. The man must meet these things. This must be seen in his life. And, and so uh, he must be a man of proven character. But I also want to suggest to you, he must be also a man of personal conviction. Not just proven character, but personal conviction. And the personal conviction must be this, that God's house and the, the order for God's house is not up for debate or discussion. If he's going to maintain that order, he has to believe it passionately. And so it might be a man who's a good man and a godly man in many ways, but if he thinks that the, these things that we're talking about in chapter 2 are kind of optional or could be changed you know, to suit the climate, we don't want that man because, because what he's doing is failing to, to maintain the order that God has said, how you should behave in my house. Remember, it said it's the house of God. It's not, it's not your house. And we've got to keep reminding ourselves that this, this assembly is not yours. It's his. It's the house of God. It's the church of the living God. He bought it, paid for it, owns it. Right? The blood of Christ paid for the house of God. Now, we're, you know, we're talking about living stones, right? It's not the physical building. It's the spiritual house. He paid for that by sh the Lord Jesus, by shedding his precious blood. And it's valuable to him and precious for him. And he said, there's an order that we, we must maintain. And so these men must believe that. They must have that conviction. And sometimes I'll go to places and they'll tell me, well, the elders said we don't have to, the sisters don't have to cover anymore. And I say, listen, the elders, have, I, mean, I don't want to be rambunctious. But listen, elders have no business to tell anybody to do something contrary to what the Word of God says. They don't have that freedom. And they'll give an account. They're men that one day will give an account to the chief shepherd when he appears. And they're going to have to explain why they played fast and loose with what the Word of God says. And I think that's serious. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. And they don't have business to do that. They have to maintain the behavior in the house of God. That's what they have to do. And so he desires a good work, but it's not an easy work. And especially today, it's not an easy work because, because we're flying in the face of, of everything around us that is saying the opposite, right? And so to maintain that, you've got to have conviction. 
And we want men of character and we want men of conviction. Now, as he talks about these qualities that these men should have, he says uh, the first thing is he must be blameless. And this is kind of the all-embracing one, really. We're going to look at the details of areas where he's supposed to be blameless, but this is the big thing. And the idea is that he's, he's a man without reproach, uh, no defect of character or conduct in which he could be accused uh, of being somehow a dishonorable person. Uh, so that, so that may, people may say things about him, but it's not going to stick. His character is such that even if people dare to say, oh, that man's a dubious man, it's not going to stick. They're not going to be able to show it to be true. He's a man of upright character. And it's a very important idea that this, uh, because there are people who are opponents, and they would love to, uh, uh, if they can somehow discredit the character of the overseers of an assembly, uh, then, of course, it, it, it kind of writes the whole thing off, right? Well, if the leaders are uh, dubious, then the whole thing's dubious. And so that's why there must be men uh, that have a blameless character. He must be blameless. He must be without reproach. Now, it's not saying sinless, because you'd never get... It's hard enough to find men that fit these qualifications as it is. And if you said sinless rather than blameless, there's only one man that ever lived that could be... But, and he is the best... He is the senior pastor. He's the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus, right? Uh, and so... But, but it's blameless. So we can't... Uh, just a blameless character. And, and he talks about <clears throat> this blameless character, and he talks about the kind of the details, and, and so he says, uh, uh, the husband of one wife. And, and again, the idea is, uh, it's not saying, w not polygamous, although we don't, the Bible doesn't teach that, uh, but it's, it's a guy who's, who's got eyes for one woman. He's a one-woman man. And so it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, say somebody could be married a number of years that their, their wife passes away and then they remarry. That would not prohibit a man from being an overseer as long as he married a godly woman who, who was going to enhance his shepherding care. Uh, but, so it's not the implication of that. And by the way, sometimes what we say is, oh, he should be the husband of one wife. Well, what about bachelors? Somebody was asking that last night. You say, what about a bachelor? Well, you wouldn't want a bachelor to do premarital counseling because it's all theory and he has no practical experience of which he speaks, right? However, the best shepherd I know is not married yet. Now, he's, he's already paid for a bride, and in a coming day, there will be the marriage. But right now, he's still single. You know who I'm talking about, right? The Lord, my shepherd, right? He's the best shepherd that ever walked this earth, right? And he's still my shepherd, and he's, he's not married yet. So I want to suggest to you that I don't, I, I, the Bible always assumes the norm, and the norm is that men get married and men have children, and they have children. Not the men have the children, but they become fathers of children, right? That's the norm in society. We understand that. And so the Bible always assumes the norm, but it doesn't prohibit a single person. So, uh, again, one of the godliest shepherds that I can think of uh, from history, church history, was Robert Cleaver Chapman. And I would recommend every elder, if you want to know what a shepherd looks like, read the biography of Robert Cleaver Chapman. He was a bachelor. Uh, and shepherded God's assembly till he was 99 years of age. Great shepherd of the flock. Uh, if William MacDonald was still alive and he moved to Jackson, Missouri and was in fellowship in your assembly, I think you might want to recognize him as an elder. I think he could bring some wise counsel and, and help to the saints. Would you think that? So, so again, I don't think it prohibits. Uh, and again, it, sometimes people get so caught up in missing... The, the intent of Scripture, and they'll say, so it says, not only must be a husband of one wife, uh, or one woman man, but, but when it talks about uh, one that ruleth his own house while having his children in subjection with all gravity, and so they'll say, well, that word children is plural. So if you've only got one child... You can't be an elder. And I, I know one assembly, uh, they, they, they desperately need this brother 
to step up to be an overseer, but he has stubbornly refused because he only has one child. Now, again, that's not the intent of what the passage is saying. And so I think we've got to be careful. But we do want somebody uh, who is uh, somebody who's not got eyes for other women. Because that wouldn't be very good, would it? Uh, it would be a disaster in the making, right? And so he's, he's got his eyes for one woman. That's his wife. And he loves her, and he's a faithful husband. And, and it talks about him being, uh, being vigilant, uh, which is uh, the idea of self-controlled. He, he's, he's a self-controlled man. And, and we want people who are self-controlled because we want them to be good examples to the flock. And if they're not self-controlled, then it's given a bad example. So that's the whole idea. These, these shepherds are supposed to be a pattern to follow. And I often like that. We talk about it in First Peter. And I, I think the idea is this, that if, if you want to know how to love your wife, look at your elders. Right? They're supposed to be a pattern to follow. You want to know how to raise your children? Look at the elders. They're supposed to be the pattern to follow. They're supposed to be that example, uh, that pattern for us to, to follow. And, and so uh, he must be self-controlled. He must be sober. And the idea of sober is not so much that he's not, he's not a drunkard, but it's the idea that he's serious-minded. It's one of my favorite words in the pastoral epistles. And it, the idea is reserving the mind for that which is important. He's somebody who reserves his mind for that. See, you know, you've only got so much capacity in your mind, and, and you can't afford to waste it on trivia and nonsense, right? I mean, I've only got so many cells up there. I want to make sure they're used for the important things and not wasted on that which is nonsense. That's the problem with our world. We have a lot of people who are wasting hours on nothing. Trivial bunkum. That's what they're doing, right? And, and, a, and a shepherd in an assembly, his mind is reserved to that which is important. Well, what's important? Eternity is important. The house of God is important. Souls are important. These are things that are going to outlast the rest of this world. These are important things. And so he's somebody that, that is sober-minded, is of good behavior. He's given to hospitality. You know, that's really important. That's also why an elder's wife is critical, too, because if he's given to hospitality, the missus must also be given to hospitality. So when we look at a man to be a shepherd, we need to think about his wife, too. Is she going to be suitable for that? Uh, to this idea of, of course, given to hospitality. The idea is addicted to hospitality. And, and why is that so important? Well, how do you get to know the state of your flocks if you never have them in your home? Because, you see, we don't have a lot of time. Like This is a conference weekend, so we've had more time than normal to visit and fellowship. But under normal meetings of the assembly, how much time do you actually get to know somebody? You know, just, hi, how are you doing? Fine. But we all put our best behavior on at church anyway, right? We all got our, we know how to act. As soon as we walk in the door, you know, it's, we've got to look spiritual. Got to, you know, we know that. And yet, when you're in the home... You can pick up attitudes. You can see things that you might not see. And so the home is very important. And let me just give you personal testimony. My wife and I were both saved out of dysfunctional families. Uh, Mother's Day is difficult for both of us, actually. It's, you know, it's really a hard day. My mother was a drunkard. I don't like to say that, but it's true. She was. And so I don't have a lot of good memories, especially I do in my early years. But when she took to drink, I don't have a, hardly a single positive memory of my mother from teenage years onwards. So I find this a very difficult day. My wife's mother sometimes would just disappear and be gone for months. Nobody knew where she was. Very disturbed individual. And so uh, I had no idea. What, when we got married, we're both saved, but we have no idea what a Christian home looks like. We have the foggiest idea because we grew up in dysfunctional homes. And the, the hospitality of the elders in that local church was how to have a Christian home 101 for my wife and I. Just watching how they reacted to each other, how they lived, how they dealt with their children. It was, it was like a school. And we, I don't know whether they realized it, but we were all eyes. We were looking at everything and we were learning. And so this is why hospitality is so critical because, and especially in our culture, where the family unit is in disarray for the most part. 
And so most of our converts are most likely going to come from those kind of families. And so how are we going to get them on the right track? Well, let them see the real thing. What, what, a, what a loving couple look like, <laughs> right? That's a beautiful example, and it sticks with you. It stays in your mind. You say, that's what I want. I want my marriage to be like that. I want my children to grow up in that kind of environment. And so the hospitality is, is really critical. Uh, apt to teach. Uh, and again, I don't necessarily think that means that somebody who's an elder has to be a platform speaker or even a conference speaker. I don't believe that. It means that he can sit down with somebody and reason with them from the Scriptures. And especially if that person is challenging, for instance, the doctrine of the assembly and, and the truth that we're supposed to uphold. They can sit down with him and say, I'm sorry, brother, but this is what the text of Scripture says. And so he's apt to teach. And I think that's very important. We need people that can do that and to, to sit down and read. Some of the best elders I know uh, over the years uh, have never been platform men. Now, I'm not saying that they can't be platform men, but some of the best ones that I've met weren't platform men. But I tell you, I never forget, and I've told this story many times, but I remember being in a basement with a brother, and he wanted me to pray uh, for the sheep in his assembly. And he got on his knees, and I, I knelt down by the side of him on this, on this couch, and he was praying for different saints in the assembly, and tears were running down his cheek as he was praying for different ones. And I thought, wow, I'm in the presence of an elder. I have never heard that brother teach from the platform, ever. But oh, what a shepherd. You see? So, so apt to teach, it doesn't mean that he has to be this dynamic uh, <clears throat> platform man at all. And then it says, not given to wine. And again, part of the reason for that is uh, it's, it's the idea of lingering long at the wine uh, because, uh, well, that's, that's dangerous. Uh, it's a dangerous thing, and especially uh, in, in cultures like ours where drunkenness is such an issue. And so, he's, again, he's got to set an example. He's got to set a standard. He's got to set a tone. And uh, I, I find the easiest way for me not to be given to wine uh, is not to drink wine. And a part of that as well, and I've got to say, because I grew up in an atmosphere of seeing what alcohol does to a person, I'm petrified of the stuff. So I just, the only time that I will ever take it is in the communion cup, period. <laughs> and I don't mind that. I don't have any issue with that, but I just would I'd stay away from the stuff. And so somebody who's an elder, not, it shouldn't be given to wine. Not a striker. It's funny how he says not a striker, not somebody that, that's a, you know, kind of going to duke it out in the car park. If you don't agree with us on assembly principles, well, uh, come on, let's go out in the car park. We're going to settle this outside. And you know, it's interesting how it's connected with not a drunkard. Because you heard the saying, the fight in Irish, right? Why do you think... They're the fighting Irish. Because they drink a lot. And when they drink a lot, they get into fights. Right? It, alcohol just changes people's conduct, changes their behavior. They get aggressive. They get, they get all this. And so he, he says, uh, not, not a striker. Not greedy of filthy lucre. He's not in it for the money. Uh, he, he's, not, he's not driven by money because, because being a, an elder in an assembly is not lucrative business. In fact, you may, you may lose money in, it in the sense that you're pouring your life into these people and you're, you're, you've got gas bills, you're driving to places, your hospitality, you're having the people. It, it's, it's expensive. It's not, so, so you can't be a man who's driven by money in, in, in what you're doing. Not given to filthy lucre, but, but patient. Oh boy, we need patient shepherds. Because sheep are wayward. You know, it's interesting, again, growing up, uh, my, my wife growing up on a farm, the west of Ireland, a sheep farm, um, <clears throat> they, uh, the sheep are such a lot of work. In fact, interestingly enough, they're no longer sheep farmers, they have cattle now. And the reason they have cattle is not because cattle are getting more money than lamb, but because it just wore them out looking after sheep. And cattle are a lot easier to deal with. Isn't that interesting? And so patience is needed because, you know, you teach the Word of God and you expect people to change, and yet they don't change. And, and it's very easy to get flustered and frustrated 
if you're not a patient man. But I, I think one thing that helps me in terms of patience is keeping to reminding myself of how patient the Lord has been with me. I think that helps, doesn't it? I mean, as a, can, you, can you agree with that? Has the, has the Lord been patient with you in your life? I mean, does, do, you, do you respond immediately to every truth the Lord gives to you and you say, oh yeah, I'm going to do that, Lord, straight away? Or do you have to hear things a few times before the penny drops? Sometimes we have to hear things a lot of times before we finally get around to responding to what God says. And so an elder in an assembly has to be patient. Again, not a brawler. He's not, he's not <laughs> out for a fight here. Uh, not contentious kind of a person. Not covetous, uh, kind of, again, loving silver. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And again, the idea is this, that God says that I'm going to give you the little church, which is your family. Okay? And if you do a good job in the little church, I'll let you look after the big church. Right? So, so the proving ground is the family. And so this man is apt to teach. Well, uh, he might say, well, I don't get many opportunities to preach. Well, if you've got ch children, you have lots of opportunities to preach. Sometimes people say, I don't get the platform very often. I say, well, how many kids have you got? You can have the platform as often as you want it, right? You've got all these children to invest in. Why don't you start there and see how that goes? And so <clears throat> the idea of uh, ruling well his own house, a good house manager, his house is managed well, uh, having his children in subjection. And then there's a lot of debate with this, with all gravity. Is it speaking of the children being grave? Because, I mean, children are generally jolly and happy, right? And so the idea is it's the, it's the elder who has his children in subjection with all gravity, and the gravity is speaking of him. There's a seriousness about him, right, that, that causes his children to respond they know dad's serious, that he's got, he's, you know, it's interesting, my, my father didn't discipline me physically. Um, I, I don't think I was ever uh, spanked, and some of you look at me and say, well, that's obvious, I can see that now, yeah, but, but, you know, my dad just had to look at me, and that was enough sometimes, I and mean, just one look, I knew he was serious, and that was enough. And so the idea is that this, this elder, there's a, there's a seriousness about him that causes his children to respond respectfully to him. And so this is, this is the man's character. Yeah, it's, it's not a novice. We don't want somebody who's newly saved and because there's a danger. And I want you to notice verse 6 and 7. These, these are very important verses, actually, because in verse 6 and 7, twice the devil is mentioned in the context of the, cal the, the caliber of these men. And it says, uh, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And then verse 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And so just to, to think, first of all, the, just the general principle that I think is important here for us to understand, and, and, and that is this, that the enemy is very real. And the one thing that he would love to do is destroy the credibility of the assembly by destroying the credibility of the shepherds. And so, so what we could say is that those that are called to care for God's flock, you're going to have a bullseye on your back. You're going to become a target for the enemy because he wants you either to be lifted up with pride or he wants to set a snare for you to trap you and to get you so that you're no longer useful. Right? Because he hates the house of God. Remember, house of God is a witness to divine order in the midst of satanic disorder. And so this is the last bastion of sanity in a sick world under his influence. And so when, this, when we make this stand for God in the midst of all this craziness, the enemy is just hopping mad because here's somebody showing a different story, a, a better story 
a more beautiful way of living. And, and, and he wants to discredit and destroy that if he can do it. And so we, we can't have a young, immature person recognized as an elder because there's a danger that he'll be lifted up with pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil. And the idea is this, that that's what got the devil into trouble in the first place. He was lifted up with pride. Pride in his own beauty, you see. And, and pride is a dangerous thing, this inner swelling. You just kind of, and it's, oh, it's, it's something every person, I don't care who you are, every person has an issue with pride. Either too high opinion of yourself or too low opinion of yourself, you're still stuck on self, and that's what pride is. The middle letter of pride is I, right? Middle letter of sin is I. And so pride is... is I focus. And so I look at me, I'm so wonderful, or look at me, I'm so useless, you're still stuck in the same place. It's still I, me, my, and myself. And that was the devil's problem. I will be like the Most High. And so we don't want to do that. And so we don't want to give that uh, responsibility of shepherding to somebody who's not ready for it because there's a danger that they'll be lifted up with pride. And then moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. This is an important statement, and I want to say this, that there should always be a clear distinction between the within and the without. First Corinthians chapter 5 talks about that talks about it here. So we should know who's in fellowship and who's not in fellowship, right? Who's within? Who's, and, and how do you know that? Well, they should be received into fellowship. There should be a clear recognition that we're receiving you into the fellowship of the assembly. And so there's a within and there's a without. And so the idea is this, those without, it says, he must have a good report of those which are without. And there are people that on the fringes of our assembly are looking in, you see. And some of them come to some of the public gatherings. But they're not in fellowship. They're not within. They're, they're just watching. But one thing they're watching is the elders. What kind of men are these? Are, are these men of caliber and character, you see? They want to see that. And so he says, uh, they, they, they must, uh, more of, he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And the snare is interesting. The snare is a trap. And the devil wants to trap us. He really does. And discredit us and destroy us. And, and of course, the interesting thing is that when he does that, then he becomes the accuser. That's, that's how nasty the enemy is. He sets a trap, and then if you fall for the trap, then he'll start immediately accusing you. Say, you call yourself a Christian. You call yourself an elder. Look what you just did. And he loves to accuse the saints. And so the idea is this, that this man, he must have a good report, must have a good testimony, not just with the saints, but outside. Because the enemy will try and get him and seize on the fact that he doesn't and will set a snare or a trap for him. So, having said all that, we just, we just wanted to deal with it. I want to go to chapter 5 again. Because what do you do when you have an elder that's a problem? <laughs> and so there's a, there's a, a chapter, we said relationships and responsibilities is chapter 5. So verse 17, we, we talked about last night, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And, and we do want to uh, honor these men that have given their lives and have proper esteem for them. Uh, not idolize them, but esteem them for their work. And, and there are many, I think, of the assembly in Springfield, and I think of Brother Walt Carey, and he's kept that assembly going. The very fact there's a testimony there is because he stayed by the stuff, and he has faithfully been there for years, and all the saints esteem him very highly because they recognize we have a testimony today because when it was down to next to nothing, he was there. We thank God for him. Right? We esteem the man, and we need to esteem them for their work. 
and they've worked, and, and, and a lot of work over a lot of years, a lot of meals cooked, a lot of hospitality shown, a lot of patience shown. Uh, just esteem that, value it. And so he says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And then he says, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox. We talked about this last night, that, that sometimes uh, there might be some financial uh, sharing with the elder. Not a salary or anything like that, but, but you know, maybe because uh, he's, he's, a, he's a diligent person and he could get opportunities elsewhere. So we, we, we say, no, don't take that. We, we, we're going to help you out a little bit or whatever. Just caring for him practically. And so it does talk about that. It says, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Now this is where it gets difficult. What if you do have an elder who is not behaving like he should? Maybe he's a diatrophies. Maybe, maybe he, 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 wants, he wants a place, but he don't want the work. And how do, you, how do you deal with that? And that's a difficult issue to deal with. And so he says, that, that, and it has to be dealt with, and, and so he says, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And so it can't be just, I don't like this guy. So I'm going to challenge him. No, no. It has to have two or three. And that's consistent throughout the scriptures, isn't it? That, that there has to be a, a, a multiple witnesses who agree to the misconduct of this individual. And then it says... Them that sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. So again, context is still elders. And, and somebody is an elder and he has fallen into the snare of the devil and he, he has to be publicly rebuked before everyone so that everybody will fear. In other words, uh, they want to, you see, if they think that he can get away with it, you know how our minds work. Well, if he can get away with it, well, maybe I can get away with it. So he must be rebuked before all. And I'm just going to say this very quickly. It, it says, uh, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. That is this, don't have any favorites. Even if you like the guy, it doesn't make any difference. If he has sinned, he needs to be confronted. And I'm charging you before God and the elect angels. This is pretty serious, you see. This is serious that we deal with this. And then, again, contextually, uh, T Timothy, it says, verse 23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake. I think Ephesus already had elders before Timothy went there. We know that, right? In fact, Acts 20, Paul calls the elders. And then he says in Acts 20 that of your own selves, men will arise up, causing disciples to go after them. I think there was a problem there in that assembly. And Timothy's left there, and part of the reason he's left there is not only to show how to behave in the house of God, but maybe there's an elder that needs rebuking. And Timothy's timid. You know what he's like. We know Timothy well. And the prospect of kind of overseeing the public rebuke of an elder is giving Timothy stomach problems. Because some of us are not confrontational by nature, you know, and some of us would rather go jogging than confront somebody about sin in their life, and you know me, you know, I don't like jogging. I don't mind walking, but jogging's foolishness. I don't like that. And so, you know, it, it's, but they, I'd rather do that than confront somebody, especially if they're an elder. And so he says, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Not to give you Dutch courage, but you're, now, again, when he says that, he's not saying social drinking is okay. That's not what he's saying. Because, again, in the ancient world, they did have water problems. When I go to India, one of the things they tell you in India is don't drink the water. Whatever you do, don't drink the water. You buy bottled water, and even that, be very careful. You buy a top brand like Dasani, and you buy it from a reputable shop because sometimes they just put tap water in and put a lid on. And so, <laughs> and, and that was like it was in the Mediterranean world. That's why they drank wine, because the water carried all kinds of waterborne diseases. And so, Timothy 
already dodgy in terms of his internal health, <laughs> already a nervous character. Now he's left in Ephesus, and, and, and there's the, the idea of an elder that's maybe gone astray that needs rebuking, uh, uh, maybe a diatrophies or something like that. And on top of that, uh, Timothy is not that kind of a guy. He doesn't like that kind of thing. And so he says, take wine for your stomach's sake, you're often in infirmities. And <clears throat> just as a warning, verse 22, he says, lay hands suddenly on no man. And of course, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep yourself pure. Don't, don't lay and suddenly on, on anyone. And because, uh, verse 24, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, some men they follow after. In other words, some people, it's obvious we can't recognize them because their sins are obvious. But there's other guys who are really good actors and they look fine. So don't be in a rush to put hands on somebody. Uh, give time to see the truth of his character unfold. Because sometimes people's, uh, you know, they can, they can fool you for a while. But after a while, it really becomes obvious. And so don't be in a rush. Now, I say all that. I want to go back now to chapter 3. We're talking about behavior in the house of God. We've been talking about the overseers. We've been talking about the church being the pillar and ground of the truth. And, and it's the only place where you're going to get the truth. So what is the truth that is so important that must be defended, that must be proclaimed, that is the special message of the house of God. And it brings us to verse 16. We've not spoken on this verse yet, and this is a great verse to finish on. He says, without controversy. In other words, there can be no controversy over this. These statements are not up for discussion, and they're not up for debate. This is the truth that the house of God exists to make known in this dark world. And what is that truth? Well, it's this, the mystery of godliness. Something that has been hidden in past ages but has now been revealed, and it is how people who are sinners by nature and by choice, how can people like that ever be like God? Godly. Is it, is it even possible? Great is the mystery of godliness, and then he says this, God was manifest in flesh. In other words, the reason Jesus came into this world is to make rebels and wretches and sinners into people who are godly. Through his great redeeming work. And so he tells us God, and by the way, don't buy into any other translation that doesn't put, the vast majority of manuscripts say God was manifest in the flesh, and the idea of who was manifest in the flesh doesn't even make sense grammatically. It's God was manifest in the flesh. And we believe with all our hearts the truth and will defend it and hopefully die for it. We believe in the incarnation that the eternal Son of God took on humanity in order that he might die on a cruel cross to, to, to save wretches and sinners and make them godly. God was manifest in the flesh. I was saying the other day, why do we only sing songs about the incarnation at Christmas? They're magnificent hymns. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. I mean, that's marvelous, isn't it? We should sing that every week. That's a marvelous theology. And, and so let's not limit it to December coming up to Christmas. The incarnation is an amazing thing, that God would take on humanity. The eternal God who ever lived in the bosom of the Father, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld His glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God was manifest in the flesh. It says that He was justified in the Spirit. Now, there's a lot of debate about, is that the human spirit or is it the Holy Spirit? And the idea of justified is declaring righteous, that his claims were right, that, you know, when somebody comes into your community and says that actually I'm God manifest in flesh, you know, you know that people are going to say, come on, we heard that before, right? So how, how, is he, how is he shown to be right? Well, the Holy Spirit showed him to be right. 
So when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came on him as a dove, right? Just affirming this is the clean place where the dove can land. This is the one who is holy and spotless. And so the, the Spirit of God um, constantly, as it were, was affirming that the Lord Jesus was who he claimed to be. And so, and of course, the greatest affirmation was given to us in the fact that they crucified him because they believed that his claims were false. But it says that he was risen again the third day by the spirit of holiness. In other words, the Holy Spirit was involved in raising him from the dead to prove that his claims were true and sure, justified in the spirit. And then it says, scene of angels. Those angels again. Why were they so interested in Christ coming into the world? They announced his birth, right? All the accounts talk about the angelic announcements of his birth and appearing at different times to different characters who would be involved in the birth of the Messiah. And so he was seen of angels. And, and even the angels ministered to him when he, when he took on the devil in the wilderness. And, and it says the angels came and ministered to him. He was seen of angels. Uh, even when he was in the garden and, and after he'd prayed that prayer, angels came and strengthened him. They, they saw all the things that he did there, watching the whole thing there. They're, they're witnessing every detail. And even when he's hanging on the cross, he says, I could have called 12 12 legions of angels. They're all waiting for the command. All they want him to say is, get them, and they're there. They're just waiting, bated breath. Please give that command. He was seen of angels. And at his resurrection, who were there at the tomb? Of course, we know Mary and different, but the angels were there, weren't they? Seen of angels. Preach to the Gentiles. Isn't that great? that this message of the incarnate Christ was not just for the Jews, but it was preached to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles, that God was manifest in the flesh so that he might redeem lost humanity. And he loved the world, all of the world, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world. And we're here today, I hope, I'm assuming, I'm not presuming, because maybe there's somebody who has never believed this. Maybe your parents believe it, but you haven't believed it. But he has been believed on in the world. And that's why we live like we do. That's why we do what we do. Those of us that are what we call believers, we believe this. We believe that God was manifest in the flesh. We believe that he died on Calvary's cross to redeem sinners, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day. We believe that message, and our eternal destiny is based on our belief in that message. Believed on in the world, and then this is perhaps my favorite part, received up into glory. If we don't make enough of the incarnation, I don't know that we make enough of his ascension. And it was mentioned at the remembrance meeting, but I want to go there, Psalm 24. I love Psalm 24 in relation to his ascension. Psalm 24, where we read these words. <clears throat> Verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Selah. Now I want you to think about Jesus He's risen from the dead, and now he is ascending into heaven. And I, I can imagine God giving the command in heaven. Lift up ye heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up ye everlasting doors. Why? The king of glory is coming in. And then it says, fresh from battle. Yeah, he was doing a battle, wasn't he? The battle for the souls of men was being fought on Calvary's mountain. 
Oh, he's fresh from the lift up. Let him in, the king of glory. And of course, down here, everywhere he went, there was rejection, rejection, rejection. We will not have this man to reign over us. But, but now, here's the word from the Father. Get the gates open. King of glory is coming in. And the next statement is this. Sit here. You sit on my right hand. They don't want you down here. I want you here. You sit here in the place of highest authority in the universe. You sit here. Then there's a second time where those gates are to be lifted up. But this time, he's not coming from battle. It's the Lord of hosts. In other words, he's coming, but not on his own. He's bringing a host with him. When will that be? At the rapture of the church. The Lord is going to come out of heaven to the air to, to, to catch up his bride. And then he won't be single anymore. He's going to be married, right? He's going to take his bride up with him into heaven. And once again, those everlasting doors are going to be opened. The gates are going to be opened. And the king of glory, but now he's not just fresh from battle, He's a Lord of hosts. He's bringing a massive host with him into heaven to his Father's house. And guess who that host's going to be? If you're a believer this morning, when that trumpet sounds and the Lord descends, he's going to come for you. And you'll be going. And you'll be going directly through those everlasting doors into the very throne of God. Isn't that amazing? And it says, for those that overcome, which simply means believers, we're going to sit with him on his father's throne. Must be a big throne. But that's what's going to happen. And so he says, why is the house of God so important? Because it's the only place you'll hear this message. That God was manifest in flesh. It, and this is the message we have to defend. This is the hill we have to die on. We are saying this, we, we can't compromise on these issues. This is why we're here. And so the house of God is so very, very important. But to become part of the house of God, which is a spiritual house, you have to experience the new birth. You have to be born again. And how does that happen? How does that change in a man's life take place? Well, you've got to believe that Jesus died on the cross, not just for sinners in a general sense, but for you. And you've got to acknowledge, I'm the sinner. He died to save. Jesus died to save. And you've got to ask and say, Lord, your word says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I'm asking right now, save me. If you're not already saved, this would be a good day to get saved. You might make your mother very happy. <laughs> you might make your mother very mad too, depending on what she's like. But, but I think for many, there are many mothers praying earnestly for wayward sons and daughters to simply accept the Savior and say, Lord, save me. And I don't know a greater Mother's Day present you could ever give than surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the house of God. We're thankful that you, the all-wise God, know how your house should be run and what rules and what regulations, what behavior you expect in the house of God. Father, you've laid it out for us in the word. It's clear. And we pray, Father, that we'd be those that would be obedient to what your word says, not rationalize, not say, but this or but that, but simply bow in reverence and amazement that you would ever want us to be part of your house. And Lord, we, we pray if there's one here this morning that's never, ever accepted Christ Jesus as their sin bearer, their savior, the one that took their place on Calvary's cross, that even this morning they would say, Lord, save me. And Lord, we know that you're, you're so quick to respond to the feeble cries of lost sinners 
who cry out to thee for salvation. So, Lord, we just ask, pray for godly shepherds. Lord, we've been talking tonight, uh, today about shepherds, and uh, we pray for godly shepherds to be raised up for your assemblies, who would be men of proven character, but also men of personal conviction. They believe the Word of God and feel no, no freedom to depart from the truth concerning the house of God or the message that we're to proclaim from the house of God concerning God manifest in flesh. And we'll give thee the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.